a lot of things going on in the congregation. First and foremost, last Tuesday, we commemorated Yom HaShoah, Holocaust Remembrance Day, a time of brutality toward our people that defies human understanding. And we find ourselves living in a time where many in this world through ignorance or outright anti-Semitism are sanctioning this type of brutality toward our people once again following the events of October 7th. Uh, I decided as we were uh, having our observance that what we really need to do is get um, people who are not Jewish but members of the community from the body of believers to be aware of these events and to see their uh, spiritual truths that are revealed through them. As many today question the right of the Jewish people to defend themselves against the terrorists who perpetrated these barbaric acts and still seek to wipe out the Jewish people. May God have mercy on our nation for any weakness that we may have displayed that would encourage Israel's enemies to feel like she is more vulnerable for seemingly abandoning the Jewish state and the American and Israeli hostages to the whims of the terrorist group Hamas. As we've seen with recent events, much of the world today is quick to downplay or even ignore what true genocide is, what took place 80 years ago. And that is why we remember these events, why we mourn the victims, why we honor the heroes, those who survived and those who helped them, who were mostly Christians. But we also commemorate these events in the hope that they will never again be repeated. We remind the world of what took place so they won't forget the massive scar that impacts how many Jewish people view God, view uh, the, the world, and, and view Christianity today. Last week, we were blessed to have Luke Hilton here. I hope that was a, a blessing to you all as, as he shared. Uh, he does the Israel Guys podcast, uh, and he was uh, sharing with us what it is like to be living uh, in Israel these days. And this Tuesday, we will celebrate another uh, special time in the life of our people. One of the few good things that came out of the Holocaust, the reestablishment of the Jewish people in the land that God has given to them, Eretz Yisrael. Not only does the land of Israel provide a place of refuge for our people in an all too often hostile world, but it's a fulfillment of numerous prophecies from thousands of years ago, demonstrating that despite all of the craziness that we see in the world around us today, God is still in control, amen? amen? And he remains faithful to his promises and to his people. We're also, as I mentioned uh, a little bit earlier, continuing the renovation of our new building in our pursuit of the land next door. And I realized earlier this week regarding the land that we've made a generous offer. And there's really nothing more that we can do to improve our position. So at this point, we are simply trusting the Lord for a favorable outcome, as we've already experienced numerous times throughout this process. So let us just go to the Lord in prayer. Avinu Malkenu, our Father, our King, Lord, we pray for our people Israel. Lord, we pray for the safe return of the hostages. Uh, Lord, we pray uh, for the upcoming celebration as we realize uh, the uh, sacrifices that have been made to keep the nation of Israel in existence. But Lord, we pray right now that you would reveal truths from your words, that we might draw closer to you, that we might feel better equipped for the challenges that we may face in the days ahead. As uh, Lord, I just ask you to help me to speak the words that you would have me to speak, uh, that the words of my mouth and the meditations of my heart would be acceptable in your sight, my rock and my redeemer, ask it in Yeshua's name. Amen. <coughs> so we had a guest speaker last week, and that means we're going to talk about uh, both last week's and this week's uh, Torah portions. The first portion I will talk about, last week's portion, is called Achare Mo, which means after the death, uh, as the Lord gives instructions following the death 
of Aaron's two sons. The portion uh, is Leviticus chapter 16 through 18. And uh, in Leviticus 16, what do we find? Instructions for the holiest day of the year, Yom Kippur. In the Hebrew, it's called Yom Kippurim, the Day of Atonements. And there are several takeaways I want to mention from these instructions. Number one, this was the only day that the high priest could enter the Holy of Holies. In Vayikra Leviticus 16, verse 2, the Lord tells Moses that Aaron will die if he comes into the holiest place behind the curtain on any day other than Yom Kippur. And yet, as we often point out, Hebrews 4.16 tells us that as believers in Yeshua, we can draw near to the throne of grace with boldness. Not, not like the high priest who had a rope tied around him uh, and had to be thinking, Lord, I, I hope that I am doing things right. I hope that the sacrifice has taken care of my sins, but we can come with boldness so that we might receive mercy and find grace for help in our time of need. Number two, in Leviticus 16, verse 3, Aaron is told he has to bring that sin offering for himself and for his family before he is able to intercede on behalf of the children of Israel. And we contrast that with our Messiah Yeshua, who according to Hebrews 7, verse 27, he did not have to first offer up a sacrifice for his own sins because he never sinned when he walked this earth. He never sinned, period. His sacrifice of himself was not for himself, but was one time for all. Amen. Number three, this is a community event. This aspect of scripture is often misunderstood by many in the believing community today. Uh, primarily because uh, the promises that have been made to the Jewish people as a community are often interpreted as applying only to individual believers today. I'll give you an example. Isaiah 41 verse 10, you may be familiar with this. In the King James it says, Fear thou not, for I am with thee. Be not dismayed, for I am thy God. I will strengthen thee, yea, I will help thee. Yea, I will uphold thee with the right hand of my righteousness. But what's interesting is we tend to ignore what it says two verses before that. In Isaiah 41, verse 8, it says, But thou, Israel, art my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the seed of Abraham, my friend. I use the King James translation a lot because these are uh, um, terminology that is about the Lord blessing Israel. And if I read it from a Messianic translation, people will think that it's unique to the Messianic interpretation. But here, King Yaakov saw it the same way. His name is even in the verse. Uh, but the term Jacob is not referring to the king who wrote the Bible 400 years ago. I'm joking around. We're talking about King James, just in case <laughs> I didn't make that clear enough. The, thank you. The uh, term Jacob, also in the verse, it says Israel, the seed of Abraham. In case we didn't get it clearly, there's a triple parallelism there as to who we're talking about. This is a blessing to the Jewish people in a community sense. So we find that Isaiah 41, verse 10 is not a promise of support from God for the individual believer. Perhaps it extends to that. But th these words are a promise of support from the Holy One of Israel, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to the Jewish people as a whole. So to understand it properly, it's important that we put the text into context. Let's say that together. Put the text into context. Point number four, atonement isn't simply the sins of the people being forgiven. The ritual described in Vayikra, Leviticus chapter 16, includes atonement for different parts of the tabernacle, the holy place, 
the tent of meeting, and the altar. Now, why does the tabernacle need atonement? According to Leviticus verse 16, it's because of the sins of the people. Now, how is the tabernacle atoned for? Leviticus 16 verse 15 says, the high priest is to sprinkle blood on the cover of the ark before and before the cover of the ark. The blood is what brings about the atonement. Sometimes blood can um, defile, as we saw in Exodus chap uh, Leviticus chapter 12, uh, when a woman gives birth, the blood that is a part of that process uh, has to be, uh, she has to go through a time of ritual purity afterwards. But here we see that the blood can cleanse. How do we know which one is which? By the context. We need to make sure that we put the text into context. Number five, the Leviticus 16 ritual involves two goats, uh, both of which picture the work of Yeshua. One of the goats, La Adonai, for the Lord, has its blood sprinkled on the ark cover. The other goat, often called the scapegoat, Azazel in the Hebrew, takes on, according to Leviticus 16, verse 21, all of the iniquities, all of the transgressions, and all of the sins of the children of Israel. Once again, we see a tripling to emphasize how significant this is. And then according to the next verse, the scapegoat is to be let go into the wilderness, um, <clears throat> although by Yeshua's time, they had modified the ritual slightly. To make sure that that goat that they had transferred all their sins onto didn't come wandering back into the camp. Uh, the ritual had been modified such that the goat was taken to a cliff and pushed off. Uh, that way we would be, make sure that we don't see our sins coming back towards us. Like the first goat, according to Hebrews 9 verse 12, Yeshua entered the holies on our behalf with his own blood. Like the second goat, Yeshua had our sins placed upon him. Isaiah 53 verse 6 says, We all like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way. So Adonai has laid on him, the Lord has laid on him, on him, our iniquity, the iniquity of us all. We also find blood discussed in the next chapter, Leviticus 17. According to Leviticus 17, verse 10, the consumption of blood is prohibited for both the native born and the sojourner. Even though that screen says outsiders, it means the Hebrew word there is the Hebrew word we translate as sojourners. And I'll tell you more about that uh, as we talk about Leviticus uh, in 17, verse 11 and continuing. Uh, Leviticus 17 verse 11 says the soul of the flesh is in the blood. This is my translation of the, the Hebrew literally. And I have given it to you upon the altar to make atonement for your souls. For it is the blood that makes atonement for the soul. And then in Leviticus 18 we find a list of inappropriate relationships that are forbidden to the Lord's people to distinguish them from the pagans that the Lord will drive out from before them. And I'm not going to go through all them all. If you want to look at them, you can just look at Leviticus 18 uh, in the following days. But in Leviticus 18, verse 28, I am going to talk about something it says there. One, uh, the people are told, uh, as we read earlier, uh, the idea the land will spit them out just as it has those before them if they follow the practices of the previous inhabitants. Uh, they didn't get a get out of jail free card when it came to worshiping the Lord. If they did the same things that were offensive to the Lord by the current inhabitants or the former inhabitants, they would get the same result. Now, the one thing that I want to point out concerning this portion Three different issues are addressed, and each of those issues, it is pointed out that it applies to both the native-born Israelite and the sojourner. 
who is sojourning in their midst. Leviticus 16, verse 29, we'll go through them, says that both the Israelite and the Ger Hagar, the sojourner sojourning among them, are to deny themselves and do no work on the Day of Atonements. And the prohibition against consuming blood in Leviticus 17, 10, as we just talked about, applies to any man from the house of Israel and to Hagar Hagar, the sojourner sojourning in their midst. And lastly, in Leviticus 18, verse 26, in these forbidden relationships, it says it applies to both the Israelite and Hagar Hagar, once again, the sojourner sojourning in their midst. So throughout the portion, the sojourner is included as a part of the community. Now, unfortunately, in some of the translations for the Hebrew word ger, we find foreigner or stranger or outsider or alien. And that keeps people from understanding the importance of the sojourner in the community of believers, even in the Jewish community. And as a result, some extend these requirements to all Gentiles rather than the specific case of the sojourner. So again, we see the importance of putting the text in context. And even as members of the Messianic community, even when we understand uh, the concept of the sojourner, the enemy's traps are still out there, traps of pride or legalism. We can easily become prideful, thinking we're better than those who have fallen for the lie of replacement theology, the false theology based on the idea that all of the blessings that the Lord had promised to the Jewish people now belong to the church instead of the Jewish people. It's also easy to become legalistic about keeping Torah, but the scriptures reveal we do not obtain righteousness through Torah keeping. In James 2 verse 10 it says, whoever keeps the whole Torah but stumbles in one point, he's become guilty of all. That's all of us. We cannot achieve righteousness based on trying to keep the Torah. The way we achieve righteousness is described in 2 Corinthians 5 verse 21. Not through Torah keeping, it says, it's through the sacrifice of Messiah Yeshua on our behalf. He made the one who knew no sin to become a sin offering for us. So that on our behalf, in him, we might become the righteousness of God. God sees us as righteous, not based on our own action, not based on whether or not we keep Torah. He sees us as righteous because of the work of Messiah Yeshua. And the Torah uh, for many of us is meaningful in our walk with the Lord. But that doesn't mean that, that we should start criticizing those who don't see things the way we do. In Ephesians 2.12, Paul describes the blessing of the Gentiles as a community as no longer being estranged from the, commonwealth of, from the commonwealth of Israel. In Ephesians 2, verse 15, Paul describes Jew and Gentile overcoming our cultural differences, enabling us to come together as the one new man, making shalom, peace. But the role of Torah in the life of the Gentile is a new experience, generally speaking, unlike Jewish people who have been uh, raised hearing the Torah in the synagogue. This is something new that came along with faith in Messiah Yeshua and the revelation that we find in the New Covenant Scriptures. But in Acts 15, verse 10, Kepha, Peter, says that trying to keep the Torah can place a burden on the Gentiles that neither our, fa our fathers nor we have been able to bear. There are many who run around saying, you have to follow Torah, you have to follow Torah. I think Peter sees it differently, that, that the revelation of Torah is to be a blessing to us. We uh, follow Torah out of a desire to please our Heavenly Father, not because we have to. It's, a, <laughs> it's actually a greater blessing to choose to follow Torah 
than to feel like we have to do it. Now I want to talk about the Torah portion for this week in the few minutes I have left. Uh, it is called Kadoshim. Uh, Kadoshim is the plural of Kadosh, which means holy. Uh, in Leviticus 19, verse 2, the Lord tells Moses to speak to the congregation of the children of Israel, the congregation of B'nai Yisrael, telling them, you are to be Kadoshim, holy ones. Ki Kadosh Ani, because I am holy. Notice this instruction is not given to just the leaders. You know, there's this tendency to think that the congregational leader is the one setting the example. But we are all called to holiness, not even just the priests. We are all called to be priests, to intercede on behalf of our people, to intercede for those who uh, need healing from the Lord, who need a miracle, who just ask us to intercede on their behalf. Peter quotes Leviticus 19.2 and 1 Peter 1, verses 14 and 15, as we read earlier. He writes, like obedient children, do not be shaved, shaped by the cravings you had formerly in your ignorance. Instead, just like the Holy One who called you, be holy yourselves also in everything you do. Tonight, in these remaining minutes, we are going to seek an understanding of what it means to be holy. I think if you ask most believers today, are we supposed to be holy? The answer would be yes. And then if you asked, are you holy? The answer would probably again be yes. But what happens when we do something unholy? How do we become holy again? How do we know if we become unholy? One reason we struggle to understand holiness, I suspect, is because uh, I think many believers today confuse and conflate uh, righteousness and holiness. And we've already talked about righteousness and how that is accomplished, how that is obtained, how we are seen as righteous in God's sight. And there are similarities between righteousness and holiness, but there are also major differences. For example, do we ever find an inanimate object being described as righteous? No. But we do find them sometimes described as holy. Does anybody know the first time we find something described as holy in the Bible? You know, whenever something occurs for the first time, it's important to take note of that. And I have a feeling you're going to get the wrong answer, but go for it. The first thing that's ever called holy in the Bible is Shabbat. Yeah, that's what I, I figured you were going to say that. Um, <clears throat> yes, uh, because the Sabbath is not described holy until we get to Exodus. It's not, it, even though it's talked about as the seventh day and set apart, I couldn't find it. We'll see if you do. <laughs> anyway, um, <clears throat> but I was going to give you a clue, but uh, Chris has pointed out the first time we find the word kadosh uh, in the Hebrew scriptures is in Exodus 3.5, where Moses is told by the Lord he is standing on holy ground. And the reality is uh, this ground is holy. Why? Go ahead. Genesis chapter 2, verse 3. So God blessed the seventh day and made it holy. Yeah, we'll have to look at the, the Hebrew on that. Okay. that. That may well be right. Um, <clears throat> made it holy might be a slightly different form of the Hebrew that, that we didn't pick up on. And yes, like we're going to talk about the fact the Sabbath is indeed holy. So for the moment, a silver star. We'll see if it becomes gold or not. Um, <clears throat> but this actually illustrates the point I was about to make. The ground Moses is standing on is holy. Why? Because he's standing on ground that has the presence of God in it. There's a bush, right, that is burning and it is not consumed. That's the presence of the Lord. Now, here are other examples of holiness in the scripture. Uh, the Sabbath, parts of the tabernacle, the priest garments, 
and the oil used in the consecration of the priests. In Leviticus, it's primarily the Lord, his people, and the sanctuary. And also, even in this week's portion, in Leviticus 19, verse 24, uh, we talk about this on Tu Bishvat, the new year for trees. Uh, fruit from trees that are planted uh, are described as holy in the fourth year after they are planted. And in next week's portion, we will see the uh, divine appointments, the assemblies associated with the appointed times, described in Leviticus 23, verse 2, as Mikra e Kodesh, holy convocation, sacred assemblies. Uh, continuing in the scriptures, we will also find the following described as holy, the spirit of God, the land, and the Lord's mountain. Now the Hebrew word for holy, kadosh, has the idea of separation, distinctiveness, purity, something cleansed, or like God, without sin. Holiness means a person or place or thing becomes special because it, God has designated it to represent him in some way. Often something will be holy while the rest of the group is worldly, uh, ordinary. For example, the day we just talked about, the Shabbat is called holy. Now the other six days are not bad days. Uh, it's just that they are not set apart as is the seventh day. Now, why is holiness such a difficult concept for us to grasp? Well, let me just share some of the challenges. We're called to be separated from this world, yet we are to engage this world to bring the message of Messiah Yeshua to those who don't know him, right? We're to go to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth, as well as Jerusalem. Uh, <clears throat> We are called to be distinct, different from the nations. We even heard that uh, in the readings this evening, yet we are called to be one in Messiah, as we sang earlier. We're called to live lives of purity, even as we live in a fleshly, materialistic, pleasure-seeking, impure world. The blood of Yeshua cleanses us from all sin, yet we still struggle with the sinfulness of the flesh. We're called to be holy like God, yet disaster follows if we seek to become like God. Think of the garden and the Tower of Babel, for example. Perhaps in our efforts to be holy and remain holy, we find how easily we can become unholy, how easily we can be contaminated by the world, the flesh, and the devil. But this was not the case for Yeshua. This may be a reason that the whole concept of holiness uh, was established, or certainly one of the primary ones. When Yeshua walked the earth, the unholy did not make him unholy. He made the unholy holy. Think of when he cleansed the men of Sarah'at, often referred to as the cleansing of the lepers where he, instead of being contaminated by them, was able to say to them, be clean. Maybe tonight you need a cleansing from the Lord, a healing touch, so that you might be holy for him. Because tonight we've talked about the restoration of the Jewish people back in the land that God promised to them long ago. We've also talked about the restoration of the Jewish people through the Day of Atonement the ritual that provided atonement for the tabernacle and for the Jewish people as a community. We've also seen how the sojourner is an integral part of the community, part of the commonwealth of Israel. And we've seen how both individually and as a community, Yeshua provided the sacrifice that brings forgiveness for sin, a sacrifice that is the only way that we can receive atonement, a sacrifice that we must accept as being offered up on our behalf individually. We've also seen that we can't do anything to bring about our own righteousness. The scripture describes our righteousnesses in Isaiah 64 verse 6 as being like filthy rags. It's only through Messiah's sacrifice on our behalf that we are able to be seen by the Lord as righteous. 
and he cleans us, not only uh, in terms of how we live, but he cleans us in terms of our motivation on the inside, in our hearts. So right now I'd like to ask, if you've never accepted Yeshua as your Messiah, but you are ready to receive the atonement that only he can provide with every head bowed and every eye closed, all you have to do is raise your hand to say yes to receiving that sacrifice on your behalf. Is there anyone? We always give this opportunity, knowing that many have raised their hands at various times, uh, that we all did that at one point, those of us who are followers of Messiah. And perhaps someone watching this out on the video, you realize you need the sacrifice that Messiah you, Yeshua provides. I would encourage you to um, just get in touch with us through uh, our email address or through um, the website or uh, even can text at the phone number. But for those of us who are already believers, perhaps you've stumbled recently in the areas of legalism and, and pride. You didn't even realize how easy it is to look down our nose at those who have a different understanding, how easy it is to fall into the trap of keeping Torah in an effort to be seen as righteous. Maybe those of us who are Jewish have not uh, had a good understanding of the importance of the sojourner in the community of Israel. Perhaps there are Gentiles who feel that they would fit in better in the Messianic community if only they were Jewish. We need to understand that God has given us a certain uh, calling and certain experiences and certain gifting for his purposes and our flesh is always saying but Lord there's still something that needs to be done before you can use me but the beauty of the message is that the Lord can use us just as we are and so um, if, if we're sojourning in the midst of the community, may we understand in a greater way the importance of our role. And if we're a part of this community, may we have a greater understanding of what it means uh, to have the one new man uh, established, primarily in Messianic synagogues. That's where we see Jews and Gentiles coming together. But maybe you didn't understand the difference between uh, trying to live a holy uh, life or being seen as righteous by your creator through the sacrifice of Messiah. But now you realize that God, God has called us to live a life that is holy. Uh, he's given us uh, numerous instructions, uh, what foods we are to eat and what uh, animals we are to stay away from uh, in terms of what we consume. Uh, <clears throat> what relationships are appropriate, what are inappropriate, how we are to treat one another. All of this comes down to his explanation that we are to be holy just as he is holy. So we can ask the Lord to replace with holy things the things of this world that we have allowed to defile us, that we can ask him to set us apart so that we might be used for his purposes. As Lord, we ask you to help us to understand our calling as a community, as your faithful servants, Jew and Gentile, Israelite and sojourner, one in Messiah. We ask you to help us to be led by your spirit, that we might better understand your truths as we live them out, that we might better avoid the fleshly snares of pride and legalism. And Lord, we thank you for the privilege of being a part of this end time work that you have called us to the restoration of your people back in the land and lord we realize that you are providing a, a new place for us to have our services that is uh, much closer to the jewish community of greenville and we believe lord that you are going to uh, use us uh, to bring that message to them the message of messiah yeshua as we seek a greater understanding, Lord, of your love, of your grace, of your holiness. We thank you that you are the faithful God, that you are keeping and will always keep your promises to the Jewish people, which is what gives us confidence 
that any promises that you have made to the nations or to the body of believers, uh, we see in that example that you will be faithful to those promises as well. Lord, I ask you to change hearts and lives to be more conformed to the image of your son as we press forward toward the mark of the high calling in Messiah Yeshua. And we ask all these things in the name above every name, in the name of Yeshua, our Messiah, and everyone said, amen, amen and amen. God bless you all. Thank you all for coming.